All right, so um, started to look through the input modeling reports. And um, uh, one thing I've noticed at least in a couple, not many so far, but do you remember the one thing I said you should never do, especially in the input modeling report? Anybody? Any kind of a big deal about it? And I had like a little box on the screen that said, never do this. Anybody? The fit a model to an output. Is the simulation is the model of the output, right? So um, gathering output data is good because we need to compare the sim to the output data. But um, if a simple static statistical model were good enough to describe an output, like a performance measure, then we wouldn't use the sim at all, right? So, so like if you took data on customer waiting time or total time and system, things like that, that's great because you'll need that to validate whether your sim works, but try to think about where would you put that model when you actually build it in arena? Like there's no, there's no spot where you could say, what do I want my customer waiting time to be? Or what do I want my total time and system to be? Because if there was, you just wouldn't use the sim, you just use that model. So, so that's why the outputs are not something you should fit a model to, because there's no place to put those models in arena. You only fit models of things that you want to put in arena to like the inputs, like inter-arrival times. That's an input, so you fit a model to it. So don't uh, confuse inputs and outputs. Don't fit models to outputs. It's like a, a key thing there. All right. And so in you know, examples of outputs, um, so as a bad example of modeling, like uh, so I was sitting at Starbucks today. Um, I ran into a student even, and and uh, and it's uh, I ordered a drink at eleven thirty nine, and my little mobile app said estimated pickup time eleven fifty one. So they had an estimated wait time. They have a model that they've built for estimated wait time, and and they just gave me a point estimate of my wait time. And so as we'll talk about today, point estimates are evil. So, but you know, for when you're when you're working with sort of the general public, people are expecting that. So I said, you know, 1151, no intervals. I picked up my drink at 1221, a half hour later after the estimate. That was a terrible model, you know, so, but that was an example that um, they may have used a simple static model parameterized based on their normal service times throughout the day. And if they would have used a dynamical simulation model um, that kept into account like, well, you know, we only have two baristas and two espresso machines and so many other things. When the input stream, uh, which they, you know, they have data on, right? I mean, like they know the mo number of mobile orders coming in, they know the number of uh, the orders that are coming in at the clerk in the cafe. It would have been really simple, implemented on Amazon AWS somewhere up there for them to actually calculate and update that say like, actually, you know what? you'll pick up the drink at 1221. So don't leave your office in the rain early and wait there for a half hour um, because you can do work and then come down a little bit later. So that's kind of an example where, um, where the difference between a crappy statistical model and a more sophisticated SIM model could have improved Starbucks. But in the end, they don't care because they already have my money. Right. So, so ultimately, like um, a lot of operations research is just, um, you know, entertainment purposes, like, you know, like customers want to know that they've got a prediction. They don't actually care if it's accurate because in the end, they're not going to leave the store without their drink. But um, if you can get a reputation for having really good estimates of like knowing when to come down, then you can get, I think, value and loyalty and all of that. Uh, so, you know, so that's the reason why we we use sims over just a simple static statistical models is that hopefully the sim will give us a more accurate picture that will change throughout the day um, and even be able to respond to the um, just-in-time information on the inputs coming in as opposed to some static picture of what um, you know the service times might be uh, you know at 4 p.m and not 11 a.m so just sort of a, a practical example question that was today. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, th there were a lot of, um, yeah, th I, and right. And, and that's, but also easy to predict, right? I mean, it's, not, it's the same fall menu they've had for the last 20 falls.
you, you might think that, but the baristas, I, I am not complaining about them. They had some experts. I mean, every when the drink hit, um, you know, the when the sticker hit the cup, I mean, it was it was made in like a professional time. It was clearly, um, and again, I, I mean, so uh, somebody came up to me and said, "Hey, you know, it seems like you could model this," and but I'm like, well there's not anything boring. Like I can't blame anybody in the store. Like it was just a whole lot of orders. So there's going to be a huge line, a huge queue, you know, just like you predict in 470. But the uh, crappy software engineers who built the app, um, you know, that's who I can blame. Like, like it's fine that things take a long time. I mean, you got, you got orders coming in. I mean, it was just shocking to see how many mobile orders are coming in and the line. Like just at that point, there's nothing you could do. But it would have been easy, like, the person there in the cafe knew that the average waiting time at that time of day was 35 minutes, even though it was nine minutes on my phone. So it's like, if the person standing there knows that, you know, for the last 15 minutes, we've had a 35 minute wait time, like, you know, that could have been something you could have modeled on the phone. So that's all I'm saying. And that's hopefully what you'll learn how to do in this class. So when somebody in marketing comes to you and says, you know, I really want you to implement this feature, then you'll have the background to be able to do it in a more sophisticated way than just guessing. So anyways, that's, uh, that's my real world story. I'm um, kind of getting back to things here. Um, you've got the output analyzer where you know, we're shifting to outputs this week, uh, next week, some advanced topics in, um, in Arena. There are this, this two lab drop policy, which you can keep in mind, but also keep in mind that lab 10 is 30 points, but there's 50 points possible. So um, if you're looking for bonus, um, then um, I mean, if you're already fine in your labs and you're pretty happy with your lab average, and maybe you don't have to worry about lab 10, maybe skim through it and get familiar with the topics, but you don't have to necessarily go through the exercises. But if you're looking for a few extra uh, points to, to boost your schedule, because bonus points for the lab 40 core, uh, category will carry over to the rest of the, the course. They'll just be scaled by the lab scaling. So, um, so there's, you know, basically two thirds uh, of an extra lab bonus built into lab 10. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, otherwise, the rest of the semester, uh, the lab time is really meant for you to work on your final projects. Uh, final projects, uh, the next deliverables really is the final week of classes. So I'm going to get those input modeling reports back to you as soon as I can get through all of them and go through all the rubrics and give you feedback. Um, and then otherwise, um, the last week of classes, you'll have a video and a final report that you'll upload to Canvas the middle of that week. And then by Saturday of that week, you'll have a couple of days where you'll be able to watch one other video and read one other final report and submit your peer reviews. And so that will be uh, scheduled deliverables there. Uh, ICAs, J3 is due before Tuesday, next lecture. Then there's ICAL. Um, which will be the next one, which will be a couple lectures after that. And that's the last uh, regular ICA is ICAL. Then ICAM is the final exam review ICA, which will just randomly sample from all the previous ICAs, just like the midterm one. And you'll be able to take it as many times as you want and, um, and it'll take the highest score. So uh, that's what's out there. Um, J2 should be available and posted. It's your final homework assignment. It's arena-based. Uh, there won't be a solution set for it because um, sometimes we use it as like an ABET metric uh, for the course, um, but it's a little bit more lap-like um, where, well, it, it's based on the kind of inventory management problem you've seen earlier in lab. So any questions about uh, everything moving forward? Questions online? Great. All right, so let's do an attendance exercise for kicks, the beginning of class here. So um, this is basically the same attendance exercise I asked at the end of uh, Tuesday's class. Um, so I'm saying here that a student's t-test is a location test. So um, assuming that data are normally distributed, it evaluates the probability of a particular location parameter highlighting parameter, in particular, the mean. So there's a group of tests we call location tests, and they're all tests of, um, of like mean, median, whatever. And so the t-test is a test of mean, but it's a test of a parameter of a normal distribution. So we assume it's normally distributed, and we're making inference on what the mean is for that particular normal distribution. So because it evaluates the plausibility 
of parameters of distributions that are taken for granted, the T test is an example of what kind of test. And I'm looking for either a one or two word answer where the second word would just be test. So either a one word or a two word answer where it's blank test. So what type of test, given that the T test is doing an inference on the parameters of a distribution, what's the name for tests which make an assumption of, about a distribution and then infer a parameter of that assumed distribution. Those are what type of tests. All right, so how many people are willing to brave enough to make a guess? Uh, it is a hypothesis test, but I'm looking for something more specific because it's the hypothesis is a hypothesis about a parameter. So hypothetically speaking, the mean is zero. And so I'm making an inference on whether the mean is zero. So the inference is on a parameter. So we call it a particular type of hypothesis test. Any guesses? What was that? Parametric, that's what I'm looking for. So a t-test, an ANOVA, a paired t-test, um, these are all parametric because they assume that the data are already normally distributed. So again, when you leave this class, if you do a t-test, someone's going to assume that you've already verified your data are normally distributed by doing a QQ plot to see if they line up on the line and then a Shapiro-Wilkes test. Both of those will be available in any stats tool you open up, QQ plot and Shapiro will. If you do those both together and they both give you evidence that you have normally distributed data, then you're golden to go on and do the t-test or an ANOVA um, and something similar for linear models as well. So parametric tests require you to do extra work ahead of time. I'm not requiring you to do the extra work in this class in part because most of the data that our models will be generated will already fit these assumptions due to how they're generated in our sims, but also in part because it's a 15 week class and I'm just trying to give you the gist of things. All right, so I mentioned that it's a location test. Uh, I mentioned that there's parametric tests, there's non-parametric tests, exact, or inexact, et cetera. I'm not making all this up. You can actually go, there's a Wikipedia page here that I think is linked uh, on this uh, slide and they have this, uh, um, parametric and non-parametric location tests up here. Um, and, um, and so uh, this basically forms like a decision tree. So I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but, um, but what I'm trying to hope you see is that it's very, there's course categories here and they get finer and finer. And in the leaves of this decision tree, they actually have a test that you're supposed to use. So as an example, it says, if you have one group and your sample size is 30 or greater, um, and you're doing, um, so one group, that means you're testing for a particular mean. So you're saying, um, I think that uh, this uh, mean is zero, then they're saying it's safe to do a t-test. Um, now that what that means there is something that I haven't told you is that a t-test is actually pretty robust to non-normal data if you have a lot of samples. Now, the case that I'm focusing on in this class is when n is less than 30, they say if you do, if things are normally distributed, um, then you do a t-test. But then it says if n is less than uh, 30 and it's not normally distributed, um, and I actually can't read what they've abbreviated here, but I would do um, uh, like a u-test, a Man whitney u-test, which is um, down here. Um, here they're tossing in if the samples are independent, but you could also do um, uh, th these tests for the one group. So the point here is that, um, you know, one group you're testing against, a, it's like a one sample test. These are two sample tests, three or more sample tests. So the ANOVA and um, uh, the non-parametric versions of the ANOVA pass, uh, come up through here. Um, down here, there's Z approximations, there's chi-squared. So these are distribution uh, tests. So the point here is that I'm not trying to, I, I, for this class, you don't need to memorize all of these tests, but I do want you to start appreciating that there are, there is a decision tree that's out there. And that as you start doing more stats, 
you will eventually get this decision tree into your brain. And that helps you figure out which test you need. Because even if you forget what the tests are called, whether it's a Wilcox and sign rank or a pair T test or whatever, if you remember the few categories of this decision tree, then you'll be able to find the test you need. But because you'll know that you'll need it. Otherwise, if you just pick randomly, uh, you know, you go into jumps, you know, hypothesis test menu, and you pick randomly out of that, then you might pick a test that'll produce a result, but that result will actually not be sound. So, um, so this is what you should sort of hopefully build up in most of your career. For this class, T tests and chi squared tests are going to be, you know, usually adequate, totally fine, but in real world data, then all the rest of these tests become really important. And you should be able to just switch from one to the other effortlessly. So that's what you should sort of build up to. All right, so this unit has been shifting from inputs to outputs. So, um, you know, what performance measures do we wanna make our decisions on? Um, how do we uh, make our sims run fast enough and yet also give us uh, uh, answers that make sense? And um, how do we, um, also deal with the fact that um, the, as we make our sims faster and faster, we can accidentally introduce this idea of bias, which I'm going to review today, and how do we deal with that. So, um, so that's kind of what we're going to get into. And last time I introduced two types of simulations corresponding to two types of systems. So terminating systems, those are systems where you care about the start point and the end point. They are real physical things. And so you care about the so-called transients. And so we have transient simulations where you include all of the data from start to kind of steady state all the way to the end. And you add all of that in to give you, say, an average performance, uh, which includes that transient data. And then there's non-terminating systems like 24-7 Walmarts or something like that, where your sim has a start um, and your sim has a finish but the real system just sort of runs continuously for all intents and purposes. And so um, you need to kind of figure out how much data to get rid of in your SIM so that uh, you only focus on a representative sample from your SIM, which allows you to guess what the true steady state is. And if you include too much of this SIM junk in your estimates, then you'll get something which I'll define formally here in a second as bias where your actual steady state is somewhere in the middle of these squiggles, but because you've included this artificial startup that your sim needed, it's pulled down and you end up estimating lower than what it should be because you've included an artifact of the sim that's not a part of the real system. So those are our two types of systems, where this beginning part matters and where this beginning part doesn't. And we're gonna focus mainly today on this type of system. And then on Tuesday, we'll focus on this type of system. All right, so um, any questions on this distinction between these? You feel like you could come up with systems that would fit um, these two modes. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about within replication time series data, so what I mean by that is this squig or this trajectory you see here is what I'm going to call one whole replication. So if I were to run this sim again, I might get slightly different squiggles out of here. And so these might be customer waiting time or queue length over time, something along those lines. And um, so every sim, I could get like an average uh, customer waiting time for that particular replication. But if I run it again, I might get a different average replication time for that or average waiting time for that replication. I could run that again and again. So I'm just saying like, so every time I run this, it looks like I'm getting a lot of data out. But for a terminating system, I'm actually only getting one data point out of here at a time. So this might look like I'm getting a thousand customers. But really what we're saying is for Monday, what was the average waiting time? So that there's one data point for Monday because these customers are all related to each other. They're not independent samples. So that's what I'm kind of saying here is that if I, in one replication, I have like a hundred customers, I might for that replication, take the arithmetic mean of their waiting time. And that is not an estimate of the mean waiting time like across the whole system. That's just for that particular day, 
what's the arithmetic mean, uh, mean that came out of, say, Monday? But I could then have another one out of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever. So what I mean by within replication time series data is that N represents how many customers I have in one rep. And I average all those together. And then that average goes along with that single rep. And then I'd run another rep to get another average. And then I would end up running my stats across those averages, not across the customers. So that's only for discrete time. Likewise, with continuous time data, um, I, instead of taking the sum over the whole trajectory, I would take an integral over those trajectory. And I might, in this case, if I'm looking for this time average, then what I'm doing is taking an integral underneath a curve of a measure that exists at every time point, taking the area under it, and then dividing it by the total time interval. And that will give me the so-called time average. Now, examples of what the, these things are, like, for example, in the discrete case, this might be um, whether we uh, are, like, if this is simulating a month, and so every sim is a month, every replication is a month, and multiple replications, you can think of running that, that month over and over again uh, in different universes and get slightly different outputs. And so across that, I can say, well, on each day of the month, did I run out of stock or not? And then I can say how much, you know, what fraction of days that month was I out of stock? And that's effectively what this would calculate here is that um, if you had a stock for all 30 days, this would come up 100%. If uh, half of those days you ran out uh, before the end of the day, then uh, this would be 50%. So that's an example of uh, discrete time. Now I could instead, have a continuous time performance measure, which would say at any instant of time, is the Q length greater than 10? And so this would be uh, a, you know, a function that only takes on zeros and ones, kind of similar to this, but it exists at any instant of time. And so I can take the integral underneath this and then divide it by the total time in my sim. And that sort of gives me a time average sort of like a what fraction of time was the Q greater than this threshold. So if this comes up 100%, then that means 100% of the time, the Q uh, had 10 or more customers in it. If this comes up 75%, um, that means that somewhere along, like that this was, that this, this was sometimes the Q was over 10, sometimes it was under 10, but um, the white space, I guess you could say, the gaps in between the times where it was greater than 10 only add up to 25% of the total time. So this gives you a so-called time average. So again, these are within replication data. Each one of these things gives me a single data point per replication. So does that make sense what I mean by arithmetic means and time averages for discrete time data and continuous time data respectively? Questions on that, questions online. Okay. All right, so, um, so th those are the types of data that we're grabbing from each replication. And so then we have to talk about how um, do we, um, you know, what are the, the issues with, with grabbing those data? And one of the issues that we have to worry about is initialization bias. And this is particularly a problem for, uh, the steady state simulations for the non-terminating systems. And so um, just background, when I talk about bias, when I'm talking about statistical estimation, what I've got is I've got an estimator that is a random variable with its own distribution and statistical uh, uh, parameters. So in other words, if I've got 10 replications, each one of them has got their its own theta i, theta one through theta 10, I can take the mean over those 10 replications and get an average. Now I can come, if I happen to know ground truth, what the real population mean is, I can compare the expected value of my estimator to the real population mean. And if there's any difference, if there's any daylight between those two, we refer to that as bias. And I can show you a graphical example of that here in a second. So we desire that there be no bias, that this is so-called an unbiased estimator. Um, and bias, if you have it, can be really difficult to get rid of. Even when your samples are independent, if all of the samples are biased, then um, it, it's, it's, it's a problem that often requires 
heavier lifting to try to get rid of. And they, this kind of goes back to the example I kind of gave earlier, where in a non-terminating system or a steady state simulation, if I'm trying to get, I'll just draw it um, on Zoom here. If I'm trying to get this, this right here looks to me like the steady state value of let's say this is time and system. So this is like customer time and system. And because my non terminating or my steady state simulation had to start somewhere, these initial customers, which are just there because my sim had to start somewhere, have a much lower time and system. And but it eventually ramps up to this steady state value and kind of where that converges, that's the true um, average time and system that customers spend. But if I include all of these data here, then the estimated steady state is going to be this line down here. And the difference between them is the so-called bias. And so if I just you know, ran my SIM and didn't have this warm-up period, I could run lots and lots of replications of this SIM and, um, and my confidence intervals will get tighter and tighter and tighter. I would get more and more confidence that this lower line was the true time and average time and system for these customers. But I would have introduced bias due to the way I set up my simulation relative to the real world because in the real world, there is none of this transient stuff. And so um, I need to get rid of the transient stuff by introducing a warm up period. And we'll talk about that on Tuesday in order to get rid of this bias. It's kind of similar to like in voting, you know, as I talk about gerrymandering and things like that. It's the process of voting doesn't necessarily introduce bias, but um, the way you slice up who is voting can create these groups so that um, are not a, a, a representative sample of the large group. So if you're making an inference about the large group by using aggregations that have not been kind of randomly chosen, then you can introduce bias. The same thing, like this is not representative of the real system, so you end up getting a bias term. So any questions about what I mean by bias then? Is that this is a systematic deviation between the estimator's mean and the real parameter of the system. And that's something we have to specially design our stims to get rid of. Simply sampling more doesn't get rid of bias. Questions online? Okay. Okay, so that's uh, that's bias. All right, now um, there's other point estimators that we can take other than means, and those are quantiles. And so we've seen quantiles before; they're just inverse CDFs. Um, so um, a uh, a quantile effectively describes the levels that uh, dominate a specified p fraction of responses. And so um, I could ask, uh, what is the pth quantile of the y distribution. And what I'm looking for is theta out. So what I'm saying, like, if I could say, what is the 85th percentile score on the exam? Well, that would mean is what score is higher than 85% of all the other scores on the exam? And it might come out to be a 90, for example. So that's a little weird to say. The 85th percentile score is a 90%, you know, because of the units match there. But, um, but that would be you know, how we would define that. So median is one special case of this, the 50th percentile or the 0.5 quantile um, is referred to as a median. So a quantile is another term, which um, is just the um, kind of the scaled version here, of a percentile. So the quantile P is just the 100 time P percentile. So the 0.5 quantile, um, 50th percentile. So all of these tiles are just kind of related to together by a scaling factor. Um, to estimate a quantile, rather than adding up things and dividing, you sort. So if I had um, n samples, uh, so n customers or whatever, 
and I wanted to estimate the 85th percentile waiting time, I would sort all of their waiting times, and I would then effectively take the one that's in roughly the 85th uh, position, 85th percentile position of the list. So the P quantile is the value from the sorted list where the index is just whatever the quantile is, um, or whatever the, the you know, whatever the P quantile is here times the number in the list, and I round up to get the index. And that's how I estimate a quantile from a list there. So in a histogram, the P quantile um, is to the right of the P fraction of the data. So if you draw your histogram, you should be able to draw a vertical line and everything to the left of that line. If you add up all of those, that frequency data, um, all of those counts divided by the total count should be around this P fraction. So that's what we mean by quantile. So any questions on that definition? What we mean quantiles and percentiles? I'll give you examples where these are far more useful than means as point estimates. Questions online. So like the common example um, here that um, is that if we're doing say a traffic simulator, so here's a micro scale traffic simulator. Um, here's it from a different visualization. Um, speed limits, for example, um, those are set based on 85th percentile speed. So they're not actually meant to prevent people from driving um, uh, faster than, because of course people drive faster than the speed limit. You see it all the time. But the hope is that they set them at a particular level and then they set enforcement at a particular level so that when you look at the distribution of all the speeds of cars going by them, that 85% of speeds will be less than the speed limit. Some will be greater, but 85% will be less. So if I was, um, let's say, simulating um, a new policy on, uh, let's say I wanted to um, publish dynamic speed limits uh, you know, in a highway system. So it's kind of what's being shown here. Or I wanted to somehow simulate some change to traffic patterns. And I had behavioral models of humans um, driving here, and I wanted to see what happens to the whole system after I implement this, then I can look at the distribution of speeds that come out of my behavioral models in my sim, and then instead of taking the mean speed, I would end up taking the 85th percentile speed from that distribution, and um, and that would be the thing that I'd say, do I need more enforcement or not? Uh, did I Was I successful or not? And that would be whether, whether the 85th percentile speed would be less than the desired speed limit for this traffic sim. So questions about that, about using um, quantiles and not means as point estimators. Questions online. There's one other common example of this that we frequently do in simulation. And, um, and it's basically using a sim to generate your own null hypothesis distribution. So hopefully getting more and more comfortable with this graph right here. Um, and so imagine this scenario, for example, and this is just a, a special case of a more general problem. An expensive item has been stolen uh, from a museum. Imagine a forensics thing during a fire alarm. Now, um, the item would have taken extra time to remove during the alarm period. A suspect is observed leaving the museum late, but that suspect claims that the reason that uh, they were leaving the museum late, late was just due to the confusion of, uh, of everyone running around and maybe they went down the wrong pathway and something. So it was just, it was just part of like, they were just in the tail of the, of the usual distribution for how long it would take of responding to a fire alarm and getting out of the museum. And so um, you've been asked to sort of evaluate the plausibility of whether they really could have taken this long to get out of the museum if they weren't you know, uh, screwing around or something else. And so you build a simulation of where you've got all of the floor plan of the museum and you instantiate people all throughout the museum and you then do a simple model of where they might go when an alarm goes off as they gradually get out of the museum. And you might then come up with this distribution of times. So this is time to escape the museum. It happens to look something like this coming out of your simulation. So um, for, and uh, 
Um, you know, as we can talk about details of how I generated this, but this is basically a simple example of what I'm talking about here. I had a map and I um, basically allowed um, things to sort of go the worst way, the best way and, and all of that. And I happened to get um, most individuals, um, very few individuals got out really quickly. Most individuals um, kind of were up in this ridge here, but then there was this sort of tail of individuals down this way that, um, that did. Some of them took very kind of long here. I can use the distribution coming out of my sim kind of like a, a T distribution. So um, I can say, all right, what um, fraction, if I'm only worried about um, the one side here, so it's like a one-sided test, I can say, um, where is the critical time above which 5% of, uh, of these null times, of these normal times, um, happen to be um, greater than? And so I might find that my critical value here is 300 and 40, uh, I think I say your estimated critical time, what's this one here, is 343 seconds or whatever for an alpha of 0.05. So what I'm saying here is that any times greater than this, we're going to assume did not come from the normal escape process and they were generated somewhere otherwise. So effectively what we're asking here is what was the 95th percentile time to escape? What was the time to escape that was greater than 95% of all other time to escapes. And if the um, suspect's time to escape, which was this line up here, was greater than that quantile estimation, then my hypothesis test is gonna reject um, their assertion that they're just, were part of the normal group that was leaving. Now, I might be wrong, but this is at least saying that it's worth looking more into because uh, there's very few people took this much, you know, this amount of time. Um, to get over that. So that's another example of we frequently use simulations as null hypothesis generators, in which case quantile estimation is usually far more useful because it, you know, it goes along with hypothesis testing than, say, estimating a mean. So any questions on that example? Is that a question? Mm -hmm. Right. That's right, that's right. So this would be the sort of assuming that like a model of the museum, there's no closed form mathematical solution for how long it should take to get out of the museum. That's right, that's right, right. And then there's no other hypothesis test to do. Like you built your own hypothesis test. So there's no t-test or chi-squared test or whatever. You just sort of say that, you know, if you trust my model, my model says under the null distribution, under the normal person escaping a museum distribution, these are the times it would take to get out of the museum. And this is the 95th uh, percentile. And so anything above that um, to an alpha of 0.05, we're going to reject as being a normal way to get out of the museum. Any other questions? All right, good, great. Okay, so. Um, Questions online? Let me make sure I don't buy anybody there. Exactly. Yeah. So just to make it clear, this solid line here, that was the suspect. This is the 95th percentile. So it's above 95th percentile. So basically any any proposed um, escape time that's above this. I would reject as being uh, plausibly from this, uh, the, the normal way to get out of the museum. And so then that suspect would be, we need to, there'd be, uh, uh, you would keep that suspect and do more further investigation, basically. Or like if this is a, you know, it's just like a drug test or something like if it came up and, um, you know, you, you came up positive for a particular disease or whatever, then you might do further testing. It's kind of like the same idea with forensics here. Um, this is now evidence that if this line was firmly inside this, then we'd say, I'll let him go. Because um, like if we knew, for example, that stealing this piece of artwork from the museum would have an average time of this with some distribution that kind of came down around here, then we might say that there's enough power that if someone is uh, was in this group, there's no way they could have stolen that thing, and we had high enough power to let them go. But um, if 
Um, so likewise, if it was really easy to steal, then this would not be a good test to use because if you were stealing it or not, you would still land in the bulk of this. So we're assuming here that there's enough statistical power that the time it takes to actually steal the thing from the museum is way over here. So its, distrib its tail only slightly overlaps with this tail. Okay, so we do this a lot, this type of thing a lot, using uh, simulations or so-called permutation tests to generate these distributions. So we generate our own hypothesis tests. Okay. All right, so um, that's point estimation, um, which is fine. That's a great place to start, but um, but ultimately, when you're talking to your peers, your technical peers, you should never use point estimates. You should always use interval estimates because uh, point estimates are deceiving. Um, they don't. They're always wrong because, like you know, they're, you're never going to be exactly right on that point. But interval uh, estimates tell you so much more. So. Our first and most important interval estimator that we talk about is the confidence interval. And so a lot of people hear about confidence intervals. They talk about, especially around election time, you know, within the, um, the error threshold or uh, the margin for error, they refer to that. And what they're talking about is a confidence interval. Now, how do you define a confidence interval? It's just a t-test. A confidence interval is every hypothesis that a t-test cannot reject. So, um, so it, it's kind of crazy that a t-test seems so esoteric, but every time you hear about someone talking in 95% confidence interval in the media and the news, whatever, they are implicitly invoking a t-test, but they just don't tell you that. And if you ask them to define, well, what do you mean by 95%? I mean, I think a lot of the media probably wouldn't know how to answer that question, right? But if you did know how to formally answer that question, then what you would say is that this interval is the interval of hypotheses that cannot be rejected when your alpha is 5%. That's what a 95% confidence interval is. So, and that's what I'm saying here, the hypothetical values of your parameter that cannot be rejected at alpha is your one minus alpha confidence interval. So uh, it's centered on your mean estimate, your point estimator of the mean. And this H is what we call the half width. And so the 95% interval half width is on both sides of this. And the confidence level, which is like one minus alpha, you can view as the true negative rate. So alpha, um, you can view as the false positive rate. And so uh, one minus alpha is the true negative rate. So it's another way to view this thing here. So the probability that any confidence interval in, in contains the true mean is one minus alpha. So what it means, when I give you a 95% confidence interval, that means that 95% of the time, the true mean will actually be in the interval I give you. In other words, 95% of the time, I'll be right. I'm not committing to any one of those estimates, but I'm saying the real estimate is in this interval. And if I give you that interval and it's big enough, 95% of the time, I'll be right. If I give you the center of that interval, 100% of the time, I'll be wrong because 100% of the time, the actual mean is not going to land right on that point. It's going to be around that point. So that's what a confidence interval is. It's, uh, you know, it's all based on a t-test. The half width of a confidence interval is this formula here. And it's just the standard error of the mean. So that's my estimator's standard deviation, the standard error of the mean, um, times the critical t-value um, for alpha divided by two, because it's two-tailed. Um, uh, at the um, degree of freedom, the number of data points minus one. So again, it's just a t-test visualized as an interval. So I can summarize all of the results of a whole you know, continuum of t-tests in one interval. That's what the confidence interval is. So it is a measure of error. Um, and as you increase your sample size, you collapse around a point. So you can get rid of that error by taking more and more samples and it'll make that half width smaller and smaller and confidence interval smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, no, R is the number of samples used to calculate the sample mean and the half width, or really just the sampled mean here. So um, for any number of t-tests, uh, well, I guess I'd say for any number of experiments, the way you could say it is like, let's say I ran a thousand experiments and each one of those thousand experiments, I gathered 10 data points. 
to 10 data points, 10 data points, 10 data points, a thousand times. For each experiment, I could calculate a confidence interval and it'd be this big. But for this experiment, it would be here. For the next experiment, it would be over here. For the next experiment, it'd be over here, and so on. So these confidences will keep moving around, but they probably hang out around one, one spot of the real line. 95% of those, whatever, however many experiments I said, 95,000 or whatever. So 95% of those confidence intervals would capture the true mean. So if I were to sort of draw that here, um, let me see, tap here. Uh, Uh, I don't know what you mean by manipulate it twice. Uh -huh. Right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, you're looking at like all the hypotheses you could test with a one sample t test all at once. So I was seeing if I can uh, do a uh, uh, quickly do a whiteboard here, but I don't see the button for that. So I'll just draw it on here. But if I were to um, if I were to draw the real line of all of the you know the theta so if the real population parameter were here um then what i'm saying is i could i take 10 data points and generate a confidence interval so this is from 10 data points generates this confidence interval and if i re-ran the experiment i might generate another 10 data points and that would generate another confidence interval and i could keep doing this and occasionally i would get an experiment that might be way out here but most of my experiments would cluster close to the true population mean down here. And so what we're saying is that 95% of these confidence intervals, each from 10 um, sample uh, experiments, will actually capture that. Now, in real life, I'm only going to run the experiment once. I'm not going to run 1,000 experiments. I'm going to run one 10 sample experiment. And so this is capturing, this is saying that if you only run a 10 sample experiment, 95% of the time, the interval you calculate will have the real estimate inside it. So like when I go to the bank's website, they give me a 95% confidence interval for the value of my house right now. Um, and I don't look, I don't care at all about the midpoint of that. I only look at the two boundaries of that because I don't actually know if I try to sell my house today, how much it would be worth. But what the bank's telling me is based on their stats, that 95% in 95 of universes, my house will sell for a value in this range. And so that's why the interval estimate is far more useful to me than the point estimate. I just ignore the point estimate once they give me the interval estimate. So any questions about that? Questions online? Great. Close that. Okay, so um, if I give you, uh, so estimating um, standard deviation, so if I give you a confidence interval, you can actually back out other data from it. So if I give you a half width and I tell you how many replications were used and what the alpha value was or what the confidence level was, um, you can then just uh, solve for, well, here's the half width. Uh, times the number of samples square root divided by the critical t value, and that gives you the standard deviation out of it. So I can estimate the standard deviation, and because I can also estimate the center of the confidence interval as the mean, I've now got an estimate of the mean and the standard deviation all compactly in one interval. So I can now even estimate quantiles, because if I assume a normal distribution, which I have to assume, because the only way you can use a t-test is if you assume it's normally distributed data. So now I've got a normal uh, assumption. I've got an estimate of the mean. I've got an estimate of the standard deviation. Now I can estimate the whole distribution. So extremely compact and useful interval. Um, now you say, well, what if the data aren't normally distributed? There are confidence intervals you can generate for non-normally distributed data, but they're based on the same idea here. Like if I did a... Uh, Man Whitney U test instead of a T test. These are the um, intervals. These are the, the hypotheses that would not be rejected by the Man Whitney U test or something like that. So um, a confidence interval is always tied to a one sample test, a location test. Normally, 
um, both figuratively and literally, um, it's the t test. So it's a little more complicated when it's say a proportion. Um, then uh, it's not necessarily a t test, but it's the same idea. Um, so um, now I can do lots of cool things. If you give me a confidence interval, I can approximate the result of two sample tests, even though it's a one sample confidence interval. So if I give you a population of data with a confidence interval and another population of data with a confidence interval, and I ask you to do a two sample test, does this population have the same mean as this population? You can compare their confidence intervals. And if the confidence interval from one group does not overlap with the confidence interval of another group, then those two groups have significantly different means to the alpha level, statistically speaking. So, um, so that's really useful if I give you those. And on top of that, um, if for some reason standard error is shown and not a confidence interval, um, but you know they're normally distributed data, you can double standard error and get an approximation for what the half width actually is. So, and that's just because of this 1.96 number. I was saying that eventually you just memorize over time um, that as the degree of freedom of the critical T value with an alpha of 0.05 divided by two, um, as, the, as the degrees of freedom goes up to infinity, then that value goes to the critical Z value of 1.96. And so as long as you have enough data, this critical T value is approximated by two. So a half width is um, in most cases just twice the standard error. And so if you give me standard error, I double it and I get a half width. So um, here's examples of that. Um, so here's an experiment that was run. Uh, this is a control group. It's showing their mean. In this case, they say there's plus and minus standard error. This is showing a treatment plus or minus standard error. If I just show this graph, because the standard errors are shown, it makes me think that the treatment made a difference, that this treatment is significantly different than this enzyme activity. Now, I haven't done the two sample t-test yet, but just looking at it, it looks like it makes a difference. But um, this is standard error, not a confidence interval. So in reality, I have to go and double the standard error bars to get an approximation of the confidence intervals. So I just double those. And after I double them, then it's pretty clear that the confidence intervals overlap. Now that doesn't mean that if I ran a two sample T test, that it wouldn't be significantly different. But that means I have to actually run the true two sample T test. If instead um, I was able to infer that one confidence interval was here and the other confidence interval was way down here and there was a gap in between them, then I wouldn't have to run a two sample T test. Under that case, if the confidence intervals have daylight between them, you don't even have to run a test. Graphically, using a one sample confidence interval, which is up there, if there's gaps between them, it implies that a two sample t-test across them will be significantly different. So it's a quick way to visually um, guess whether you've got a significant difference in data. So any questions about that? So the big thing is the takeaway here, confidence intervals are generally twice standard errors. And if there's a gap between confidence intervals, that means a two sample test would be, uh, would reject the quality hypothesis. And these are the type of data that you'll get out of your SIN. So you'll have to do these sort of analyses with. Okay. Questions online? All right, so I'm not gonna ask this attendance exercise, um, but um, so don't worry about that, but I will just bring out the question. So um, if the non-overlapping uh, here were interpreted as 90% CI bars, um, what could we conclude about the p-value of a two sample t-test? And um, the point here is if they're 90% bars, then that would correspond to a two sample t test with an alpha of 10%. So I could say if for an alpha of 10%, since they're non overlapping, then the p value would be less than 0.05. But, um, or sorry, it would be less than 0.1, if I'm meant to say less than 0.1. 
So that's what I'm kind of trying to say here is that um, confidence intervals uh, change their size based on what alpha you use. So the um, a 90% CI is going to be narrower than a 95% CI. 100% CI is going to be the whole real line. And so, um, so I need to know uh, what percentage these are, but then knowing that, I can actually make inferences about the size of these p-values because the p-values are bounded above by the alpha. So if there's a gap between there, then that means this p-value is less than, in this case, 10%. Does that make sense? It's kind of a more, a little more abstract, so don't worry too much about it. Um, but um, so confidence intervals, I can get my mean. It's just uh, the mean of the confidence interval is the sample mean. The half width is just half of the total size of the confidence interval. Standard deviation can be estimated with a formula. If I, um, under the normality assumption, I actually get a whole estimate of the distribution of the outcomes because I know the estimated mean and standard deviation and I assume it's normal. And so with that, I can even get quantiles out. So of a normal distribution, um, whatever quantile you want, you look up the critical Z value for that quantile, multiply by the standard deviation, add the mean, and you'll get the quantile out for that. So, um, so a lot of information can be summarized in a simple confidence interval. The other interval that I want you to be, um, oh, sorry, then I'm shifting real quick to um, quantile confidence intervals. So before we get to prediction intervals, which is the other interval you need to know, um, for, um, for quantiles, we also have confidence intervals. So this is a little hard to wrap your head around, at least for me initially, but, um, but when someone asks for the 85th percentile, whatever, speed, that in itself is a point estimate unless I give them an interval. So I can say to them, I actually don't know exactly what the 85th percentile speed is, but it's somewhere between here and here. So it's somewhere between 70 miles per hour and 73 miles per hour. So I can have a 95th percentile confidence interval on an 85th percentile speed. Um, so, uh, and the way I calculate that, um, so if I've got R independent replications and I want to um, calculate the, um, the P quantile, then this is the formula for the half width around the, my estimate for the quantile. So um, the idea here is that I just say I wanted the 85th percentile, I plug in 0.85 times one minus 0.85, divide by my number of samples minus one, multiply that by that critical Z value um, at whatever my quantile. So if this is 95th, uh, so it's an alpha of 0.05, I put in 0.05 divided by that two, and that gives me this half width, but it's actually like a half width in kind of index space or probability space. So if I go to this example here, it kind of makes this a little clearer. Um, if I have a bunch of data, I sort it from lowest to highest, and then I've got their ranks in the sorting. So you can see that these data are just general data, but then these ranks always march up by one, 779, 780, and so on. And so what I do is if I want the, in this case, um, the 0.8 quantile, so the 80th percentile, of uh, if I want a 95% confidence interval on the 80th percentile of these data, then I calculate my point estimate first, which is just sort of the 80% position in the list. So since here there are a thousand data points, I go to the 800th smallest value, and that's this one. So that's my point estimate, 21203 right here. And then to get my lower bound to my upper bound, then I go my 80th percentile, I subtract this half width, and it says go to the 78th percentile spot in the list, and that'll be your low end. I add the half width, and it says go to the 82nd percentile position in the list, that's your upper bound. And my 95 percentile confidence interval for the 80th percentile um, of these data is going to be from this 780 position, 188.96, up to this 820 position, 256.79. And that's what I get here. So this is my point estimate, and this is my interval estimate. So questions about that. Interval estimates on quantiles. It's a lot going around, but it's just a natural extension of interval estimates on anything else.
Okay. All right. So uh, only a couple other slides left and then we'll be caught up here. Um, so, um, and there's not much to do today. Um, the prediction interval is the other interval that you should be familiar with. Um, the confidence interval is kind of a, it's, it's a measure of how close you are to an actual mean. A prediction interval is um, actually sort of a prediction of a distribution of points that you could get the next time you ran the experiment. So um, if a prediction interval has a, has a similar formula as a confidence interval, but there's sort of this extra one that's tossed in here. And if you let R go to infinity, whereas the confidence interval collapse around the mean, uh, if you let R go to infinity here, or the number of samples go to infinity here, then the prediction interval collapses around the actual population mean and sort of the actual population spread in this random process that you're modeling. So whereas the confidence interval is about an estimate of a mean, the prediction interval is sort of about the variance of the estimates left to gather. And so when I'm running my sim, if I'm trying to estimate the mean, that's a confidence interval. But instead, if I'm running the sim and trying to estimate the variance, I'm effectively trying to estimate the, the prediction interval. So it's kind of like saying, um, every time I run my sim, I'm going to get a different output. Now, part of the variance that I get from running my sim just comes from it being a simulation. Um, but part of the variance I get just comes from it being uh, the, the natural variation in the system. So initially, just through small numbers of samples and uncertainty, I get a spread of distribution spread. But as I run more and more replications, I have less uncertainty about the actual variance, and I collapse to the actual variance in the system. And, um, and that's where the prediction interval, it will never collapse to a point. It'll collapse to the real variation in your system. So like in my coffee example, if they gave me a prediction interval, that would actually tell me the spread of times that my coffee would likely be ready by, um, as opposed to them just giving me a point estimate of kind of the middle of this prediction interval, which is what they actually did. So um, it doesn't matter, you know, like, in the case of the Starbucks example, there always will be a spread in how much and how much time it takes to make coffee. Um, if I'm estimating that spread, there will be additional spread due to the fact that I use a small number of samples at first. But if I use more and more samples of the Starbucks, I eventually will converge on the real spread. And that's what the prediction interval is. So any questions about the difference between prediction interval and confidence interval? One is about estimating a mean from data. The other is about predicting um, the variance of a distribution um, using small number of samples. Questions online. Okay, so um, quick note about where to find all this stuff um, in Arena. Um, there's a bunch of ways to get data out of Arena. Um, I've got some notes on Canvas on how to use these read-write blocks. Um, the the typical way we'll get uh, data out of Arena is using these record blocks. You'll have some experience with this in Lab 9. So you can basically have entities go into these record blocks, and at the instant they go into the record block, they trigger a process to write data out. And so you can say all sorts of things that you want things to be written out the instant the entity goes into that record block. And so um, you'll learn about these types in lab nine um, and lab 10, but uh, basically there are groups of these types of measurements. Tallies are list of records generated by a single simulation run. So every time the entity goes in there, they add one to a this, this tally list. And so I can have, for example, a time interval list. So if every entity um, has a, a, an attribute, representing some critical time, like when they entered the system, then I can have Arena um, record the current time since that time, like that difference, and then take the difference and add it to a tally list. Um, likewise, I can do a time between. I can do an expression. So every time the entity goes through, I see how many items the, the, the entity is carrying, and I add it, I add that expression or, or some 
a, some mathematical expression of that number to a list. So every time an entity enters it, I add one to this tally list. I can also do a counter. Every time an entity enters into it, I raise a counter by one or by some integer value that is um, that you know might be uh, linked to the entity or just might be some constant. Uh, yeah, add five every time the entity goes in there. Um, so uh, these recorded data um, can be saved or processed in the statistic data module. Um, so this is um, uh, you know so the details of this we'll go into again in lab nine. Um, so, but basically using this module, I can dump these tallies, counters to, to a file. Um, I can also specify things that have to be done at the end of the simulation. So I can say, I want to calculate something over the continuous time interval of the whole simulation. So one of these integral statistics, um, I can do like um, the max value of my giant tally list at the end of the simulation. And I can write that out as one value that corresponding to that replication. I can take the average, um, some time average value of some uh, continuous time data. I can take that out. I can also generate frequency statistics like histogram data. So that can be dumped out at the end of a, the simulation after all of the customers have been run through. And all that can be organized and saved out um, in this uh, statistics data module. Um, some of these uh, records are summarized in the reports, the crystal reports, and also in the out file. Um, you can find them per replication and also across replications. But generally, we save them into, um, and you can also, there's this, you can dump them out to a CSV file. But generally, um, there's a DAT file that this statistics data module that's binary that um, must be opened in the output analyzer, as you'll learn about in lab nine. And then from inside it, you can run statistics on those data. So you can have it generate um, confidence intervals, um, have it compare means, do t-tests, um, compare variances, do correlelograms, um, ANOVAs, all these sorts of things inside the output analyzer. Um, you know, more, you know, fun, you know, jump and so on are gonna be more functional than this, but um, this at least gives you a, a decent start. And so as an example here, this generated a one sample a confidence interval for a uh, cost that came out of this particular simulation. And so with that confidence interval, I can now report to the customer that the real cost is somewhere between the low end and the high end. Um, and that way I don't have to give the customer a single value when I didn't run really enough uh, uh, replications to warrant giving a single value, I can now then be more honest and say, I actually don't know what the real cost is going to be, uh, but I know it's it's very unlikely it's going to be lower than this, and it is very unlikely it's going to be higher than this. And that's a far more useful thing to report to a customer, and that can come right out of the output analyzer. Um, and uh, lots of other things we can compare, like I said, using t-tests, using ANOVAs, inside the output analyzer. And then in lab 10, you'll learn about the process analyzer where you can go even farther, where uh, you can basically have it run scenarios in an automated way across your models and compare them and then do post hoc tests on them. Um, so um, there's some Canvas videos on how to use the process analyzer. If you find yourself going into your models for your final project and adjusting a parameter, rerunning, adjusting parameter, rerunning, and doing that over and over again, look into the process analyzer. Because in the process analyzer, you can just tell it, take this parameter and run the sim for all 10 values of this parameter. And it will automatically do all those adjustments for you so you don't have to manually do it. It's very similar to behavior space in NetLogo. So different things you can do there. And then we'll talk about in lab 10, you can even go crazier with OptQuest where it will even uh, walk over a parameter space and figure out how many replications it needs to run for each parameter combination, and then show you the trajectory over this optimization. So if you're doing a sophisticated optimization, then the OptQuest is a great tool for that. But for most people, I think the process analyzer will be very sufficient for the projects you do in this class. So any questions about the stats that come out of ARENA? All right, so um, I just want to show you like two more slides here, um, and then I'll go over these again on Tuesday. But really, there were like two slides that need to be covered as new data here. I mentioned we're doing transient simulations. 
The big question is how many replications to run. The typical way we're going to do that is with a power analysis, which we've already seen how to do. What we've now that we've learned about using confidence intervals, the half width formula. Now I can say instead of a, doing a power analysis, run enough replications for your 95% confidence interval to be no bigger than this width. And with that, you can end up doing a pilot study to figure out your standard deviation, estimate a half width for the number of uh, replications you already ran, and then figure out how many more replications you need to run to squeeze that half width down. And, um, and that is a much quicker way to figure out how many replications you need to run than to doing a power analysis. You can't guarantee the power you get out of it, but you do know you're going to get more power out of it, and um, it's still a very useful thing to be able to limit the size of that confidence interval. So that's a preview. I'll, I'll go over that exact same formula again, but you'll see that formula, I think, in lab nine, if not in lab 10. Um, so um, this is the formula when they're referring to figuring out how many replications you need. It's the half width formula, which is right here. All right, and so again, we'll go over that next time um, in class now with a uh, attendance question. And so if I get my mouse back. And so the uh, question I have here is um, how big or describe a 100% confidence interval. So that's, um, so describe in as few words as possible, a 100% confidence interval. And that's all I've got for you. So I will see you Tuesday. I hope you have a good weekend. Any other questions, feel free to chat after class. Um, Otherwise, see you Tuesday. Any other questions online? If not, that's all I got for you. So I will go ahead and end the meeting.